Hello, everybody, and welcome to another BeagleCast, episode two. Today, we have a lot of exciting topics. First of all, some announcement events. So September 14th, we're going to have Jason on at TI for a reduced system design efforts of Beagle board modules, new product update. It's going to be an exciting, uh, exciting little show separate from BeagleCast. But first topic of the day is you guys just got back from Embedded, Embedded Open Source Summit. How was that? It was incredible. Um... Yeah, so um, I know Drew was there as well. Drew is the one that doesn't have video. Um, you know, Kathy Giori, also from uh, the BeagleBoard uh, board, was was there. Um, and so many different topics, so much interest in Beagle Play and Beagle Connect Freedom. Um, lots of uh, you know interest in 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 like what we're doing next, always. But um, um, we had a great uh, a roundtable session. I think that should have been recorded. Um, where we we um, you know talked about some 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 future stuff as well as kind of caught everybody up on Beagle Play, Beagle Connect Freedom, um, some of the the software work that we've done around that. Um, you know, I had a uh, there was a couple other Beagle uh, related sessions. Uh, Vaishnav did one on um, uh, the robotics control using Graybus um and some of the optimizations he did to try to offload some of that stuff uh for for lower latency um there was another session um from from me on using um uh, zephyr and linux kind of tied together um to try to make um you know connecting up to, to sensors um easier and just kind of different ways to get started with uh with, with zephyr and how working with linux makes it makes it easier um, so there was good sessions, but, but man, I just loved everybody coming by the, the booth and, um, and all the energy that they had to hear that, you know, Beagle finally had a 64 bit, you know, quad core, um, solution and an affordable package and, and just kind of reconnect, um, um, with, with a lot of, uh, the, the, the kind of heart of the Beagle community there, right? The people that that actually, you know, make products. Um, um, one of the more exciting things to come out was the Bootlin um, is um, kind of redoing their embedded Linux training for ARM64. Um, and they've chosen Beagle Play as kind of their, their main platform for their um, ARM64 based uh, Linux training. Um, and if, if you haven't experienced the Bootlin embedded Linux uh, training materials before, they're awesome, right? All open source, right? And you can, you can hire them to come and give uh, it, you know, in, in person trainings, which are fantastic, right? They can answer all your questions. But what they just give away online for just kind of getting into it, it's incredible. It's a, just an incredible set of documentation. And the fact that they're doing that around Beagle Play, um, I, I couldn't be any more excited. Um, if, I'm, if nobody stops me, I'll just continue kind of doing some of the brain dump. Um, you know, no, Mender please. was there. They were doing some stuff around the a Yocto project, and they had a Doom demo um, running on, on, on Beagle Play. Um, but... Uh, you know, I think um, Nishant was also there. Um, he might have some um, some more information on kind of I, I don't know what what we can talk about the future with with the Octo, but I think the future with the Octo and Beagle Play is bright. Um, and um, you know, I think we're going to look at seeing really great support um, in the Octo for 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 Beagle Play. And of course, the Mender guys were there showing um, not just Doom, but but um, uh, from our over-the-air updates, right, using Mender um, on on Beagle Play and doing some Beagle Play giveaways. So just a just a ton of excitement and interest around Beagle Play um, at the you know from the people that are kind of driving the future of Linux. So um, I, I I just want to go back. I <laughs> want to end. Nishant, what was what were your impressions of um, EOSS? Yeah, I mean there was a lot of activity happening uh, especially on, around the zephyr space which was very really exciting to see um, and a lot of vendors with many solutions uh, coming around zephyr which kind of moves zephyr from the old um, hackathon kind of environment to actual long duration sustenance product environment that's a huge transition uh, and yes ti is listening we have m4 support of am62 in upstream uh, which you can actually use without needing any sort of an SDK for a change uh, and similar stories to come. 
Yeah, there are tons of interest around Zephyr. I think the, um, you know, the, I think the R, the, the why R toss question hopefully isn't something that, that people are kind of asking because you know if you know why R toss, then you know why R toss, right? It's a, um, you know, if if you need something with really small memory requirements, like right, really controllable latency, um, you know, very manageable, um, you know, bombs in a much smaller predictable environment, right? I think it's an um, but you still want writing. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily consider it a Linux alternative, right? Because what Linux does is kind of in a whole other um, category with the, you know, all the things that the, the kernel provides from hardware abstraction and networking and, and, and um, stuff. But if you're looking to kind of follow a similar governance model where there is only one, you have the way to contribute, right? There's a, a driver model um, that allows you to, you know, create system APIs, like the sensor APIs and stuff that, that allow you to kind of create very generic solutions for things. Um, like Zephyr is a really compelling way to go for that. Um, and gives you that kind of familiarity of um, like project management that Linux does, except you can just do GitHub pull requests instead of having to do mailing lists. So maybe even a little easier than Linux. And there's also- oh, we like our mailing lists. <laughs> I, I, I still, love mailing I still lists, working. but not it, everybody. It takes does. a while to get used to be able to read them unless they're Linus rent, you know. Um, and there's also uh, cool add-ons for Zephyr, right? Like there's the Arduino core, Jason. Did you guys have been working? The Arduino core, MicroPython. Like there's a lot of things that just can easily kind of build on the the app. Right? So you've got a, a, a POSIX. Most of a, a you know, I think they're still working on newer compliance, but a pretty complete POSIX environment. But you can just kind of create a single binary application. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I spoke a little bit at the conference about, um, Arduino and MicroPython, um, and, um, like, it's pretty easy to build, um, you know, Arduino and MicroPython on top of, of, of Zephyr and then, you know, to kind of, um, you know, move it around to the different platforms, right? They utilize the, the Zephyr abstractions, um, but you get the familiar APIs of those programming environments, right? So we've got uh, Arduino Core up and running on Beagle Connect Freedom, as well as, as MicroPython, both of them on top of Zephyr. Um, and um, yeah, so it's fairly easy to start running um, Arduino applications um, or MicroPython applications on those platforms, just thanks to, to using kind of Zephyr underneath. and and kind of that uh, consolidation around Zephyr. But you get some other really cool features um, because you can use things like uh, MCU boot and, and then you can go to other infrastructures like Goliath and you can do uh, co-op based uh, over the air updates, right? At the same time as doing, um, you know, just familiar Arduino programming, right? You can kind of create these background services to do updates, um, you know, to get kind of richer networking experiences than what you would get in just like an Arduino alone environment. For sure. And I was I was very impressed because I was, I'll be honest, I, it was dawning for me, right? I've never actually used um, Zephyr before. So I was wondering, you know, how hard is it going to be? There's not a lot of tutorials out there yet. There's not a lot of people kind of necessarily publicly talking about it uh, in the normal forums. But then, you know, you follow the documentation and sure enough, it's super easy to follow. I had Beagle Connect Freedom ready in maybe 10 minutes, just following the docs from the Zephyr project and, you know, West Flash, you're, you're off to the races. That was fun. Yeah. But you also pointed out to me that the, the flashing utility isn't uh, um, like part of it because it's got a different license. And so it didn't go part of the upstream merge. So you had to download the flashing utility um, and then West Flash would just work. Um, so I think that's an important one to note. And I think I'll change the upstream patch to kind of uh, to try to pull it in the re with the the requirements install, um, so that you get the you can actually get the flasher utility, even though it's not part of um, Zephyr itself, right? Um, right. It's just a it's just a pip install away, but um, you know, um, better to um, not need to manually do the pip install. For sure, that was maybe the the one tiny snag, but then it's just a Google away, right? It's it, it comes up really easy yeah. to find that file. But. That's definitely yeah, that's another project that we need to push to mainline too, because we're we still have our own fork. But well, I think our fork is going to become the upstream for now, right? I don't know that there's if anybody wants to step up to kind of maintain the uh, the BSL Python um, library, right? But the the old uh, twenty five six whatever it was, 
2653. I can't remember the, the part number. I think it's 2653. Uh, BSL is, um, not uh not maintained anymore right so it works great um and you know so we're kind of maintaining um our fork which i think can might become the new head unless somebody else decides to take it over fair enough drew what about you any any key takeaways from uss that you want to talk about yeah i think one talk that i enjoyed a lot was uh christoph from lenaro gave a talk about uh how to write uh dt bindings device tree bindings um which was very helpful um i think it's an area where everyone always does things wrong the first the first time so um the more advice we can get on how to write device tree bindings um better it's very helpful um so i really like that talk um and trying to think of other ones. There was also a, a good talk uh, from Daniel Vetter about how to do locking correctly, locking correctly in the Linux kernel, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but the other thing that's quite awesome is that the videos are already up now on Linux Foundation's YouTube. So there was actually a bunch of things that I couldn't uh, attend or I missed because I was talking to other people. So um, it's really awesome that they're already up there now. So I could go check out all the things that I didn't manage to get to um, when I was there. Yeah, I'll try to remember to put the links in the in the description below. Including the yeah, the talks, uh the, all the Beagle talk all the Beagle related talks are up there now as well. So look and check those out. Um some some software roadmap items that kind of came up for me. It's great to have the those talks online. I'm still catching up with, with them myself. Um I know there was a lot of interest in Android on Beagle Play. Um and I think that there was some some good progress there on kind of how that's um might be maintained a little bit in the future, but um, there, there was there was um, there, there's still always ongoing interest in embedded Android, which um, so so that um, was an interesting topic. Um, I think another kind of interesting roadmap topic, you know, the, with this Arduino core for Beagle Connect Freedom um, and sitting ne next to to Kathy Jory um, <laughs> for the, the trade show. Um, we spend a lot of our time talking about microblocks, um, which is a, um, you know, it's an, yet another um, just block-based uh, programming language, but because it's, um, um, I mean, some people call it, they call it a virtual machine, but it's kind of a, uh, an interpreter-based um, solution. Um, it really makes it very easy to kind of jump between targets, right? So looking forward to putting out uh, uh, micro blocks on Beagle Connect Freedom as well, right? And providing remote programming strategy for that. Hey, there's the crew. <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> so this so is you got me, and, you know, me and Kathy there on the right, and then the TI folks. I'll let you introduce the TI folks. Yeah, this is Jay in the center with a with a black T-shirt, Vignesh with the red T-shirt, Vaishnav with the white shirt on, and. This being Nishant on the left side. We had a lot of good um, uh, Czech food while we were there too, um, and, and and even a few Czech beers. So it was a good time. Recommend that everybody come out to um, the um, Embedded Open Source Summit. Yeah, I'm jealous, Robert, and I couldn't make this one, but next one for sure. Well, I think also next year will be in North America, I believe. So that that will be, uh, e I guess, easier for people obviously that are in North America to attend. For sure. All right. Well, I guess switching tracks a little bit, our friends over at Seed have an interesting EV charger project called the Recharger. And I'll be the first to say that, you know, I'm I'm excited about that because I would totally rip up the current EV charger in my garage for a for an AM62 based solution. So Jason, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, at, at first I was kind of like, well, yeah, I think it's cool. Like I would love to work on a, you know, a charger solution just for that same purpose. I've got an electric car and, you know, like I'd love to have an open solution for it. But um, what I learned from there was actually a lot of interest around the booth around this. And I wasn't really sure why. Um, um, and I, I learned at the show there were a lot of people building, um, you know, EV chargers there at the show. Right. That that's what they were working on. Um, and, um, you know, there's a few things that I think that this really solves um, that, that aren't getting solved other places. I think the fact that we're not just doing open software, we're doing open hardware, um, especially the analog side of things and, and opening that up and going through all the, um, the certification efforts and, and the, the testing efforts 
um, and releasing those analog hardware design files um, is going to solve a real gap um, in the developer community. Um, and then um, one of the things I didn't really think that much about is just how diverse um, the set of um, integration challenges is um, or are, right? So there, there are a lot of different types of, um, of integrations that, that need to kind of happen for the, um, the EV charger um, market, right? So people that are running in a, like condominiums or a, apartment complexes or businesses that have like parking out front, the, the types of different uh, like payment solutions and business models, um, whether or not, you know, you know, you pay for parking and you get, EV, you know, like a, a bonus for EV chart. There's just there's just so many different monetization models um, to be applied, you know, different types of, of memberships. And, you know, uh, it, 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 it just kind of blew me away how much different types of, of, uh, of business solutions were needed. But the hardware really doesn't need to change that much, right? It's just about the software integration and, and the business model, um, you know, being able to take control of supply chain and actually put these solutions out, um, you know, into the world, right? To try to, um, uh, you know, help. You know, in the in the U.S., I think there's a lot more uh, single family dwellings, and and you know, there's just. Um, when you go into other parts of the world that are maybe more densely populated, right? The, the business models really, um, you know, change much more drastically. So just that, that need to have that integration flexibility was really there. Um, and then like the, the, the Everest project, right? Just how much of the solution that it, that it has the opportunity to um, kind of solidify around, um, right? Having a GUI platform, having a payment platform, Right, having the, the cloud infrastructure um, hooks, right? Um, there's a lot of diversity in what's needed, but there's also a tremendous amount of commonality. And, and Everest is the Everest project is doing a really interesting um, effort to kind of um, uh, to, to, to provide that, that consolidation point of um, that core framework so that you can um, easily just focus on your integration aspect, just create your app. Um, with all the right functions and APIs that you need in order to 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 you know create your business model, um, and now with Recharger, right, you have a, a standard hardware platform that's open, um, and you can get involved in today, right? And there's a there's a Discord channel. If you read the the seed uh, blog post, it'll point you to the Discord channel. Um, I think we really just need to try to pull in all those people that are interested there at EOSS. Um, there's no less than maybe a dozen companies that were engaged in doing this stuff there. It was a lot. Um, and, um, and I think that if other people, you know, get involved and kind of shape the direction of this project with us and kind of do it with us, um, we can really make something um, very enabling for people. I think EV charging is one of those classic open source tackleable challenges because you have a couple of big companies that have gotten the certifications for some, I would say, you know, relatively simple technology, right? It's like a pilot signal for to, to switch AC, or if you have, you know, some some higher level communication for, for fast charging, for DC fast charging, but ultimately it's just getting the certifications, getting the infrastructure in the first place that's open and can be hacked on. And then I'm sure we'll, we'll have the same thing we've seen of 3D printers, we've seen with Linux, we've seen of so many other things that, you know, just explosion of number of solutions available, right? Yeah. And I, and I think the the Beagle Play makes a really good target for um, the the software platform, right? Um, you know, we got to get these these good old you know embedded display panels right out there, but that these will all be you know available for people. And you got the you know the touch screens, um, yep. you know, nice fast GUI performance. Um, I guess surprise announcement, but these are available in DigiKey now, and they're they are going to be shown in the documentation on um, on the Beagle Play documentation. So these are OLDI displays, nineteen twenty by twelve hundred, thousand nits of brightness, um, and um, I think they're in the one hundred fifty to one hundred seventy dollar range right now uh, from from Lincoln Tech. But that's very new to me too. So there, there's an, yeah. there's an orderable link now. 
There is an order of a link. Yes, the documentation should go live probably today or tomorrow at the latest. But you can you Ooh, can get them from can Digi. Send it upstream. Yeah, we should probably have a display plugged in. Yeah. Yep, and their touch touch works. Yeah, they they're oh. awesome. So you can look forward to that. But sorry, go ahead, Jason. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> you didn't cut me off. No, I was I was kind of done. Right to me, like that was the, the the big thing, like opening up the analog side with all the certifications, right? You know, dealing with all the different business models through, you know, having it be open hardware, you know, having it be like, um, you know, Eric and I spoke about this really. We wanted this, like we call this a reference product, right, rather than a reference design, um, because people would yeah. just buy them off the shelf and 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 build build product off of them, right? There, there, you know, there's, you know, some work, um, you know, there will be certifications done, but, you know, the, um, you know, if it's suitable for your application and you don't need any customization, you'll just be able to buy it off the shelf um, and, and create your, your your product off of it, right? So, um, yeah, so, so Eric and I are, are calling it a, a, a reference product um, rather than a reference design. Um, and and then right just how much of the problem everest is solving um right and how you know it's kind of got that that linux foundation governance right that's going to allow the big players to contribute um in the in the right ways to um and democratize access to the little guys that want to just you know make their own ev charging club right in order to, to kind of justify you know the these maybe smaller scale installations with very focused business models um and even so, for at home right nobody talks about the idea of an upgradable like a software or and hardware upgradable evsc over time right it's normally it's just an appliance you toss it in you charge but what if i want to get analytics out of it what if i wanted something fun of the display what if i wanted to control the rest of my smart home or integrate somehow with it right um i think we think of evscs as this really boring appliance right now but there's a lot of potential for fun of them Especially if later they add things like vehicle to grid, other stuff like that. Oh, that's going to be yeah. that's going to be a lot. Of that, that's that, that was really the 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 big ask, right? Was when was you know, when are we going to allow the flow of current going the other way, <laughs> um, right? To be able to use those those batteries, right? So I think that's got to be on the the near term roadmap, right? That's got to be you know something that that we we work together, um, you know, to to make happen this vehicle to grid. And I, I bet there's going to be a lot of compliance issues, right, to get started with. But there's plenty of enthusiasts out there who have their own, like, microgrids, basically, in their houses, experiments, who are more than willing to to integrate it. So I'm sure we'll see some some interesting developments come out of that. Any other stuff on Reach Charger? Yeah, the comments, Ishan, are you going to be installing one? Well, let's see. Let's see how it how, plays out. Yeah, how, <laughs> how good is your home insurance? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what about the TI efforts around um, the the EV charging stack, right? Because I think yeah. that I think there's a lot of opportunity for reuse and and a lot of the TI software efforts um, around uh, EV charging solutions, right? So I know that there's um, some other people making you know, you know, more or less open hardware, right? But 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 yeah. you know, open stack solutions. So. TI, TI works with, uh, we have a, a what we call the reference design with um, with Pionix um, out in, in Europe. Um, so it's a it's also an open source uh, EVSC platform um, that we've been showcasing. Uh, right now it supports the AM62SK and a board from Phytech, but Beagle is the next one to be added. Um, Beagle Play is very much at the core of, of the plan for it. Um, the, Kind of weird thing about that is it's based around the the CCS type, you know, fast fast charging protocol for to talk back and forth for not just the analog pilot signal that you get with like J1772. So um, it requires a, a a modem from Qualcomm currently. So I think that's kind of slowed development down a little bit. I don't know what the driver situation is with that. Maybe Nishant can comment better on it. Nishant's actually charged his car off of it, if I'm if I remember right, right? Does the can we put that modem on the the microbus? Is there one from like Microelectronica already, or do we need to? Um, Not currently, but I think that's one. that's on the list of things we need to do. Because there's a bunch of cell modems already. If you're talking about a cellular modem, are you talking about a different type? It's of modem? not a cellular. Okay. It's it's to to do the actual CCS signaling. Okay. So if you're trying to get like the car's MAC address, things like that. If you want to do plug and charge, for example. Okay. I think your your audio cut out, Nishan. If you're trying to talk. No, no, no. Um, I was trying to share stuff to show people how it looks like. Let's do it. There we go. That's how it looks like. That just looks this like is the AM62X. Yes, the yes, screen. yes. But the module of it is the AM62X based uh, module. 
uh, running Everest. Uh, we have Flutter running with it. Uh, that's what the UI is uh, driven yeah. by. The same Lingit Tech display that we were talking about previously um, drives the entire system off. And there's a you said there's like a Qualcomm modem in there that allows the, the communication outside of the wireline communication, right? Because there's you usually have like a, you, the the connector has what is it five pins, right? You get three power and then two communication um, signals that come across. All right. Yeah, actually, I did enable the driver. Um, I was pretty straightforward. There's an upstream version of the driver, so it wasn't much much of a big deal. Just a def config update. But that's so. There's there, there's need to have not just the wireline communication, but wireless communication as well. No, that no, that the modem is wired still. It's just the actual protocol. It talks over the the cable. I think it's uh, multiple voltage signaling levels, things like that. It takes care of. Okay. I'll have to look at how the how Seed ended up uh, doing that on, on on that design so far, right? If they've um... yeah, if, if we are interested, we should probably call in uh, Skyler and a few other people to talk about how EV charger system looks like. That might be interesting. Yeah, maybe we should do a separate EV charger session and get um you know one of the Seed guys, the Seed engineers on as well. Um, I think this is probably a deep enough topic we can spend you know half an episode on. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's we'll plan that for for a follow up episode. Then that sounds like a great idea. But in the short let's... term, we're going to get that link up in the documentation. Yes. Um, I'm looking at, looking towards Deepak here, <laughs> the link of the documentation, so we can you know finally recommend a, a display for Beagle Play. Yeah, there's technically actually two. So the only difference between the two is the type of bezel. So one has like a tablet looking over molded bezel, and the other one's a, a thin bezel, depending on how you want to mount it. And Andre's been working on that section of the code base anyway, so he'll probably be pushing it pretty quick. Yeah, the, the pull requests in there just need to format it a little better. Yeah. All right. Do we want to talk about the elephant in the room? Is that is that the next topic? The final final topic that you guys your your big announcement? Well, we did have one yeah. the Sean, the Sean plug your ears. So, uh, <laughs> Andre, we did have one question from a user on the IRC on uh, Slack for Jason, for Jason. So it was talking about oh. BCF and using Arduino Core. Uh, they were wondering if that's actually pushed mainline or if that's still only us. It's only us as far as Arduino Core, right? So the the the, the BCF uh, support is um, is mainline. Um, I, I don't know that I patched the BCF much itself, but the 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 there's the device trees uh, and like the um, like the config files for for Arduino Core um, are sitting in the SDK Next branch on uh, our our GitLab right git.beagleboard.org um, slash beagle connect slash zephyr slash zephyr <laughs> and then it's the the SDK Next branch um, but I'm uh, I. I uh, I, I had um, the, uh, I have a couple cleanups that I need to to push um, uh, into there uh, to to kind of show the the, the uh, it, it had GPIO what, what's working in there is just GPIO um, but the the ADC and um, there's some other functions that are working as well I have to look at it now with like I squared C and UART I think are working as well but um, I need to um, to kind of clean up and push that into SDK next and then to the SDK and then clean up and push it upstream. So no, it's, it's just sitting in SDK next branch right now. But the idea is eventually you'll be able to add it as any Arduino core um, to the ID. So you would just do, you know, have yeah, the so um, not into, so the, I, I haven't gone as far as planning to push it into like Arduino core itself. Um, right. Cause the, the Zephyr um, target. So this was originally done um uh, by uh, Druva Gole as a Google Summer of Code project, um, I think under the mentorship of a number of the the Goliath uh, folks, uh, Mike Stitch, uh, um, Chris Gamel, um, they were mentors um, for this um, project that, to put Arduino Core on top of um, um, Zephyr, um, and you know I think that, that they might have some 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 roadmap right just kind of support Arduino Core development. Um, for all of their, um, you know, the, their targets, right? Their Zephyr targets, where they, which I think are mostly the Nordic devices, but they also they'll, they'll support other devices, including the uh, the Beagle Connect Freedom, um, right? Uh, you know, I think that's a um, another um, <laughs> fun EOSS discussion is like how we're going to increment that. So we're we're actually going to start kind of weekly discussions with the Goliath folks. Um, to uh, put uh, Goliath on uh, Beagle Connect Freedom, 
um, using the um, Beagle Play as the border router, um, right? So there needs to be a little bit of code on the border router. So you can do the co-app calls um, from Beagle Connect Freedom up to the Goliath servers. Um, anyway, the, um, the, the, the punchline is that there's, as I don't yet know where Arduino, the Arduino core on Zephyr like has an, an upstream um, life as of right now. Um, but uh, I think, you know, starting those discussions with the Arduino folks, Arduino announced was, was that there at the, the show and they've announced that there are members now of um, Zephyr project. Um, and I think they released their first product, the R Uno R4 or something like that. Yeah, correct. Uh, I I chatted a little bit with um, uh, Federico, um, and um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. We actually worked on the Arduino Tray project together. And um, anyway, I, I chatted with, a little bit with them. I, I don't know, really know what their future plans are, but I think that we'll continue to have discussions with. Um, both Goliath and Arduino to try to get um, Zephyr support for Arduino Core in like Arduino Core itself, right? And I think that Arduino themselves might be motivated to um, to maintain that, at, you know, um, as new members of the, the Zephyr project. That's exciting. So does right. that does that clear the way for um, <laughs> the the <laughs> that that beautiful piece that beautiful board? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, you know, Beagle made a commitment, um, you know, as, as early as we could, I think, to to be a part of advancing um, RISC-V um, and more openness um, as low as possible, right? We're all about open hardware, right? Um, you know, we're also about open silicon, but I think before we can get into open silicon, we have to start with just an open ISA. And so the risk five ISA is something that we've wanted to, to make sure that people were able to develop on. And, and this Beagle five ahead board really gives the, the software infrastructure, right? The ability, a nice, reasonable high speed platform that people can um, use for native application building um, with the risk five um, 64 GC. And then the other elephant is that other letter that I'm leaving off of that statement that I need to, <laughs> um, right? But it's this um, a, a Risk Five um, 64 uh, GC instruction set architecture, and that's just the main uh, the, the the main CPU. And there we're using an Alibaba T head uh, TH1520, which yeah I think some some other people have, have used that, so that's, that's starting to get some some visibility, but I think that, you know, we're going to provide the, the, the most widely available, best supported uh, platform for a high performance um, RISC-V board out there. Um, uh, the That main CPU core, the, the Juanti C910, um, there's actually RTL out there, not just, not just um, OpenISA, um, there is openness within the silicon itself, not the full SOC, mind you, right? Not the, the layout, right? But there's actually a, uh, a set of RTL for the Jean TC 910 out there. Um, I'd love to say I know it aligned with the actual silicon we got. I, I, I can't be 100% positive of that, right? I think that's that's something that um, you know, we need to explore. Um, but this is a very high performance um, core, um, three issue um, super scalar, four cores, two gigahertz, um, out of order um, execution. Um, in uh, like, a, I think there's kind of three different um, uh, phases where it can can kind of where it can do out of order completion. Um, so um, it's it's fast, right? It, you know, if if you um, I guess I'll finish talking before I try to get other people involved. But I, what I we love kind of we need to kind of leave out a little bit is the V um, because the the vector instructions were, were um, synced prior to the um, ratification of the vector instruction set for risk um, risk sixty uh, risk five um, sixty four um, vector instruction set. So um, they've got an early implementation that's not aligned with the official standard, right? 
Um, but if you enable those instructions, right, this thing outperforms, you know, a 72 class processors, right? This is a, it's, it's, it's a fast CPU core, um, and a good implementation of it. Um, so, um, and it's, you know, reasonably, uh, power efficient as well. Right. Um, you know, where I think, um, in the end, um, you know, we're able to run this full bore without, um, the heat sinks or fans, right? Um, not to say that don't recommend using one, but it's very possible to, to go without it. Um, well, okay, I better step away from the mic, let other people speak up. Oh, and there's a lot of other CPU cores, not just the C910. There's a C906, a C908, uh, there's an NPU, there's Imagination um, Power VR in here. Um, there's a H.264, H.265 encoders at 4K. Um, it, it's a complete SOC. It's not just a, that's not just really fast CPU cores. It's a, it's a really complete SOC, um, you know, capable of targeting, uh, mobile phones, um, but, um, also IOT applications and, and, uh, many other things. Right. So, um, but our, our goal with this is very much about software development. I'll just say that, um, you know, I think if, um, uh, for us to kind of provide the typical longevity that people expect from BeagleBoards for this particular platform, the interest would have to be extremely high, right? Because this is built off of um, 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 what kind of low production silicon, not high production silicon. Maybe we'll see that change um, and general availability. I've seen some possibilities of that um, um, be tipped, but um, we'll, we'll see if, if um, what the longevity of this is. You know, talking about longevity and stuff, uh, a lot of users on the forum are always asking about mainline. And since Drew has been kind of going crazy and packing on everything lately, uh, just a couple of days ago, he got um, mainline um, MMC to finally work. And so I don't know if he wants to talk about yeah. his status, about his plan of attack for this processor. Yeah. Um, and I mean, also in terms of longevity, um, so there's um, this core was designed probably three, four years ago. Um, so even things that were ratified at the end of December 2021, like Vector 1.0, are not are not in this core. Um, so I think you know I wouldn't be too worried about longevity of this processor because there will be future ones, right? That are going to be have a better feature set in terms of the risk five profiles that they support. Um, but the key thing is that to have you know silicon now a board now that people can use and can develop on um, and and move software support along so that when um, Silicon does come out that supports those newer extensions. We'll have a better foundation to build upon. Um, so yeah, what, what we're shipping on this is a older kernel that Keyhead supports from Linux 5.10, <clears throat> which is very old at this at this point. So um, the first thing I did was I went and uh, booted mainline on it. So right now we have the current mainline, which is 6.5 RC3 running on it. Um, so this boots up into like just the console. So I posted patches on Saturday um, for mainline device tree that boots up into just the console sort of environment. Um, and then later on, I was able to get the MMC working. So this is not uh, like the full support for it. It's just using a very simplistic mode um, so that we can get to the point where we can boot from the MMC um, device. Um, and now the task is to add all the functionality back into it um, that's in the vendor kernel that's not an upstream right now. So um, I'm working on that now. Um, but the nice thing right now currently, like I can boot up, I can boot from UMMC with current mainline kernel. Um, so that's quite nice. Um, but of course, there's not much functionality there right now. So if you're looking for functionality, you still want to be using the, um, the images that you can download from BeagleBoard.org. Awesome. And um, yeah, so I did, I'm going to do a little self-correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, <laughs> I, I was just saying I was going to do a little self-correct. I said there was a C908. It's a C902. The C908, I think, is something I read about recently. It's a roadmap yeah. processor. It's right? a new There's one. The C902 or the C90. Yeah. yeah, like keeping with the great tradition of ARM, it's, it's not like uh, monotonically increasing. <laughs> over time right so there's like the, this is the c910 but the c908 is a new one that is not out yet um so it can get a little confusing but the big core in here the quad core is the c910 which is the out of order full stage pipeline one 
Um, and then, yes, yeah, so we do also have the C906, which is a smaller core. I think that's for audio, right? Um, and there's also yeah, like the, Android uh, core as well. Yeah, the 906 is for, for audio DSP, and they've got a fairly rich audio DSP subsystem. And then um, the 902, I think, is used for like a power management um, uh, subsystem. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for people that now have a Beagle 5 ahead or are interested in getting one, um, if you want all the functionality to work, all the hardware, you still want to download the, or you want to use the Octo-based image that comes on the board, or you can download either the, the Octo-based image that we have on the website or um, the Ubuntu-based image. But both of those are using the, um, the older T-head vendor kernel with lots of patches from Robert. So um, everything works nicely in that. Um, the, the things I've been working on is to get it working on mainline. Um, so right now, basically, you get a console that you can use and uh, including from UMC. Um, probably the next thing after that is to get the Ethernet working. Um, and we'll just keep on iterating from there. And weren't you saying there's a fun project going on right now because only one CPU is enabled on mainline. So we have to work on yes. SMP. And I think there's another ratification well, that's through or? I think the the part of that is that um, there's the AON or always on uh, FPGA that kind of does the system management tasks that um, you might have uh, from SCP on ARM or something like that. So um, right now we don't have that in the mainline Linux right now. So we need to add in support for that. Um, and part of, part of that is adding the device tree binding and adding the device tree nodes around that. Um, so they'll, there already was a little bit of discussion um, with the Leachy board around that. So I think that'll that'll continue. So once we get support for basically loading that um, gate uh, the gateway or the um, you know the FPGA configuration into that always on PGA, then I believe we will be able to then bring up the other CPU cores. Yeah. So right now it's just running with single core. So it's still very early days in terms of mainline support, um, but uh there's a couple people including myself that are lo looking at um getting mainline support for this soc um so yeah i think also now that more people are getting the board um now that many people have ordered probably starting to get their shipments i think uh, we'll probably see it start to pick up more i myself i sent uh you know i uh sent one to one of the risk five kernel maintainers uh, actually they both have them now so Hopefully that that'll work, and I think we'll try and get some maybe some additional boards out to some of, some of the other kernel maintainers to get things moving along. Having a board is definitely going to be a big motivation for them to actually use it. Yeah, and and we have we have several thousand boards in the pipe um, with currently trying to make our plans for like what's what kind of happens after these first several thousand are gone, right? So that's um, and that's going to kind of evolve over the next couple of months, right? So as people kind of, you know, express interest and kind of show what their plans are, um, right? Now's the kind of time to kind of get engaged and kind of plan, you know, larger volumes over time. Um, and the, the distro status, right? So it's, so Ubuntu, um, so, so Yocto has kind of the, the optimized tool chain, right? That's got the, the, the non upstream, um, vector instructions. Um, whereas Ubuntu is really just using a GC um, and not a V compiler, right? So there's no vector instructions within the Ubuntu compiler um, because those weren't ratified when essentially they locked down their, their core. And if they were, right, it would be for the, the actual um, upstream ISA. Um, but Fedora and um, also, I think there's also a Fedora image. And I think that uh, Debian, um, Drew, you pointed to the fact that uh, it's now looking like Risk Five is going to be a, a um, they've kind of locked in on um, yeah uh, release it's officially supported now. Um, unfortunately, there won't be another release until what like one year in a year, year and a half, yeah, year and a half, year and eleven months. So it's um, on Sid, it's on Sid. Yeah. So but well, I think as of this thing, week, it's on real Sid. So <laughs> I, it point. might also help for the purposes of having a Debian image. Is that right? Make things easier for you, Robert. Yep. So right now, we, our Debian image we ship is based on ports. So over the next few weeks, we'll be we slowly merge into um, regular SID. And then uh, I think Bookworm is the uh, snapshot release right now, or is it Trixie? Bookworm is the current release, and Trixie would be the release oh, yeah. that's coming up, I guess, in a year and a half. Yep. So um, as things move to SID, they'll slowly end up in Trixie. So within, uh, let's say, a month or two, we'll start having Trixie snapshots, which will be 
SID, but two weeks stable. So cool. Yeah, and right now you actually have, what I've been using is your Jaunty Ubuntu repo, which in there you have scripts that allows you to choose um, what root of us you want, including Debian, mm -hmm. um, right? So you can have Debian or a Ubuntu console image or Ubuntu XFCE image. That's correct. Um, and then users will have to watch out. Um, the master branch is now mainline, and so I branched off the vendor kernel. So you can still build the vendor, but yeah, for a lot of things Drew and I are working on, we're, 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 more, we're more worried about mainline, so yeah. So when you do a git pull on it, it will be the master branch, which is mainline. So you have to switch over to the T head vendor if you want all the graphics and fun stuff. That's just for the Jaunty Ubuntu repo, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. So and then the Jaunty Yocto repo yep. will still be what is shipping. And so when T head launches their next uh, snapshot release, we'll rebase the Jaunty uh, um, Yocto. So. And for people that happen to look into Git history, you'll notice um, it's a bit unusual in that like the SDK releases from T head are one commit, which is a bit unfortunate. But um, just to give people a heads up, like that's that's how we were able to access it. So uh, unfortunately, we, we can't give anything more granular than that. Yeah, sadly, there's one commit every three or four months. And yeah, yeah. We'll we do our best to break it down and figure out what commit they actually use for like from meta open and embedded, meta Yocto, and just you know reverse engineer what it actually was. And um, another item, so the a lot of this, the SOC documentation that we've had access to in leading up to this um, is not yet public, um, but it will be. Um, you know, we don't have the exact release date, but um, you know, Roughly a couple more weeks uh, is kind of the guidance I'm I'm given. Hopefully, um, not much longer than that. Um, but uh, there will be um, a reasonable set of documentation. Maybe you know, maybe not everything we're used to from like uh, the TI folks. <laughs> you can't see me um, shot a nice snicker a little bit, but <laughs> yeah, who do absolutely amazing SOC documentation. Um, right uh, for for programming all the peripherals and uh, all the wonderful things that we we love about uh, the ti socs but there will be something um i think it's also worth talking about the beaglebone form factor here um and 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 maybe my uh, choice of using a micro uh connection right um uh, at least so that you know uh, people are aware of why why I, I asked for that to be be used. Um, so the Beagle about micro from, USB three here. Yes, it's a micro USB three. So a super speed uh, USB, but it's got a, a, a micro connection rather than a Type C. Um, we're pretty space constrained in the end on this board. It might not necessarily look like it so much, but um, you know it's a ten layer PCB and um, it's a uh, uh, you know we ended up being fairly space constrained it, it's it's a 1.8 volt soc um so for all the the the, the p8 p9 headers that's a, a micro um b connector there um that, that he's showing um uh the we we had to put level shifters on for for everything in order to try to maintain some compatibility with capes um and uh to bring everything to 3.3 volts right so it, a lot of stuff started taking a lot of space on the PCB, um, and, and we were also trying to make this fairly um, cost effective. Um, but you'll see these these headers that we originally developed for um, uh, AI64 um, that have um, partial through hole and partial surface mount um, gives a lot more routing area. Um, yeah, you can see that the um, uh, well, there you can see the micro B connector, right? But the um, um, those those headers are are partial through hole to give them the retention, um, but partial surface mount, um, right? And we can we can uh, unfortunately it's a it is a custom connector that we can make available to people if they want them. Um, we try to avoid custom parts in our layouts, right? But you'll either need to change the layout to use a, a standard through hole or or surface mount um, connector. You could just use an all surface mount if you wanted, but it won't have the quite the um, retention that the, the 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 combo through hole surface mount does, um, but it also makes the PCB slightly wider, um, right? But it, you know this is still largely compatible with um, you know cape add on boards. Plus, it's got the microbus shuttle, um, so we can use kind of the, the all the microbus um, expansion as as well. 
Um, but you look at the, the, the micro B, right? Do we avoid the need to handle the, the cable swap um, and PD for dual role? Um, because we can act both as a, a host and as a client, right? So it's a single USB 3 controller. Um, but we can just put a hub on there if we want to be able to act as a, a client. Uh, and right now, the main way to flash the board is over the USB client connection, right? That's the that's the way we instruct people to flash the board. Um, so a little bit of a of a of a trade off there. Um, we ship with the um, uh, the micro A um, male to um, standard type A female, um, right? So that cable ships in the box. A um, little bit of a frustration for me. We don't ship the other cable, um, but those yeah, which, work. Uh, Robert's really showing cool. right now. Um, right, the micro B to to standard A male, um, um, male to male, um, uh, type A to to super speed micro B. Um, are still pretty, they're, they're less common now than they used to be, but if you looked at all these original USB 3 super speed hard drives, right, use them. Um, but you can just use the board with the standard micro B um, USB 2 high speed cable and flash it that way, um, you know, potentially power it that way and use it that way. And you've also got the five bolt you don't, jack you, on there. You can use a micro B. So, and I, in my testing of flashing like the Ubuntu, like the four gigabyte Ubuntu image, like, it saves about like 60 seconds to use the super speed cable over the micro B cable. But um, unless you're flashing images really often, um, which some, some, some people have like Robert have been during development, it's not too big of an imposition to just use a normal B cable that you might have from like any, any old USB device. Um, so that's nice as well. Yeah, it's only like 30% slower, so it's, you know, not bad. I mean, the bandwidth is a lot less, right? But we're also not writing at the full USB super speed, uh, you know, line rate. Yeah, we're still relying on U-Boot to transfer the data to the EMMC and write it, so it's... Not it's, quite yeah. 5 or 10 gigabit per second or whatever it is. Right. So if, if all you have is a normal... Full 5 yeah. gigabits. Yeah, if all you have is a normal right. micro so, B cable, it's it's not a problem. Then you, have, then you just have 480... Um, my, uh, megabits per second, yeah. right? So 480 versus five gig. Which at this point, the only thing you're really going to be using that for is for flashing the image, and um, most of the activity would be happening right with the cable that we include in the box, which is when you want to connect USB devices to the Beagle Five Ahead board. We're we're still like um, you know Robert did a fair bit of work in the Ubuntu image to kind of produce what we consider kind of the standard Beagle board out of box. Um, that ultimately is not supported in the Yocto image, unfortunately. So it ships with, without what I would call the, the BeagleBoard out-of-box experience, which is you can plug in the USB cable, get a network connection that way. If it has Wi-Fi, it acts as an access point. Um, and right, you get the, the, the a snapshot PDF of the documentation as a file on the, the, the USB cable. So um, that was implemented. When, if you flash the Ubuntu image, it's far closer to the BeagleBoard out of box. It's just the without the vector instructions, the GUI is slow, and um, you also lose um, the CSI and the GPU. GPU, yeah. yeah, because those those are have vector instructions in them. So if you want to use the CSI or the GPU, you really have to have the the vector enabled compiler, which isn't right. in Ubuntu. Which is in the Octo image, but for most people, if you just boot up with the default image that's on the device, it's rather plain because it's the Octo based. So for myself, I, I like the Ubuntu image much better. So I, I went and grabbed that, which people can get from uh, beagleboard.org slash distros, right? Um, if you go there, I put the yeah. link into the chat, but um, you can go there and you can download it's the www.beagleboard.org slash yes, distros. Okay. Right. Or if you now go to, um, um, Beagleboard.org slash latest or latest images, um, those both forward to the um, distros page now. Right. And I think, I think the, uh, yeah. So if people have a Beagle 5 ahead and they've tried out the default install that's on there and they're looking for more functionality in terms of software, I would recommend downloading the Ubuntu image. Um, though, of course, you lose the um, camera input CSI currently in the Ubuntu image. But these are all things that I think we'll be able to fix over time. Um, especially now that we have uh, many more people involved in the project. Um, uh, you know, before launch, we, we were kind of doing all the development in private. So now that it's launched, we can uh, 
you know, get more people involved, ask questions, figure things out. So, and I've also been talking to the few people at Canonical that work on the Ubuntu Risk Five image there. So, I think we'll see a lot of improvements in a short amount of time. And of course, now that more people are involved too, we can talk about the hardware cap limitation. You know, the vector of GLib is like, what direction does the community want to go with that? Because there is a ton of silicon now with the 0.7.1 vector instruction, which was not supposed to be out. Yeah, and to, I mean, to, to, um, to go into that a little bit, um, so one of the uh, exciting features of RISC-V is the vector extension. Um, and this also provides a lot of performance gains that you uh, have in the ARM world with Neon and now the scalable vector uh, extension, I think it's called. And in, in the Intel world, going back to like MMX and SE and now AVX, um, these are sorts of things that accelerate like uh, signal processing and multimedia and these sorts of things, right? Um, so it's quite Im important, I would say, for RISC-V getting on par in terms of performance with ARM. For example, the people at Google that are working on the RISC-V port of Android um, feel that the vector extensions are very important for performance in Android. Um, the unfortunate thing is it took about six years for the RISC-V vector instruction uh, um, to get ratified. So it wasn't ratified until the end of 2021. So while this, the core that's in this SOC was being developed, they didn't have an opportunity to, to use the ratified version. And they used what they thought was gonna be a ratified version at the time. So when this core was designed like that was um, claimed to be what was gonna be ratified, unfortunately it did change. So um, it's not the ratified version, but um, this um, 0 0.71 draft extension of vector is in a lot of silicon currently, and it will probably be in a couple more chips that will be quite popular. So we will see, uh, support for it might proliferate more. Um, I would think it'll land in the Linux kernel this year, and then we will see if it ends up in things like glibc. We'll have to see what distros like um, Ubuntu uh, decide to do with regards to supporting that. Um, but we'll see. And the other good news is, you know, going into next year and, and beyond, like there will be RISC-V silicon that supports the 1.0 vector extension, um, and then we'll probably see support getting added for vector to additional like libraries and, and things where um, those sorts of optimizations can really help. Um, so we're, we're kind of in a trans, like, you know, a, um, a transition right now um, in the risk five world. So um, I think we'll see, we'll see things improve. Um, and I do think what's in this SOC is gonna be common enough that we will see support land for the version of vector that's in this chip in some projects at least. And, and, and we're committed to continue to make things in the BeagleBone form factor, both in RISC-V and in ARM, right? So newer um, RISC-V and ARM SOCs. Um, I think, you know, we, you know, also chatted with the, the Bootlin folks and some of the CAPE compatibility layer stuff, which, you know, we need to kind of pull back from upstream and reuse on our, our own stuff, right? Because um, upstream U-Boot um, now has um, the extension uh, capability, um, I think, we still have more work to do on kind of standardizing the CAPE nodes, um, right? We've got a fair bit documented in the docs.beagleboard.org about what the compatible nodes are, but um, right, there'll be more done there to kind of uh, make sure that um, the overlays for the different uh, CAPEs, right? At least the, the, the Beagle standard CAPEs and, um, you know, which we you know, hope to continue to, to kind of grow that, that base of, um, uh, you know, kind of supported capes from BeagleBoard.org. I do have to mention because I have seen that question asked in the forums. Uh, I've seen people be a little confused um, about the PRU. So unfortunately, no PRU on Beagle Five ahead. <laughs> That's no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there's not. I mean, there are other coprocessors, as we talked about earlier. Right now, in terms of how people would program them, that's um, we don't really have good public documentation on that. It might might change over time, but there is nothing that's going to be kind of low latency timing, very tight timing loop sort of capable like the PRU on this chip. Um, it's actually one of the things that I think makes the Citara chips really unique is that most other SOCs don't have that sort of uh, real time core on, on Dyn. Yeah, that, that's really one of the magical things coming from the the TI Citara SOCs. Like there's, there's, there's nothing else there out there and the, the that low latency um, um, you know capability that that the, the peer use have there's just nothing else out there and I guess one thing that's good to mention around the Beagle Five is the Beagle Five is meant to be BeagleBoard.org sort of a brand or community for Risk Five um, boards so 
this is one the beagle five ahead is one of the risk five boards that beagle Butterdorg will be involved in making but um there will be other ones and and that's kind of gated by um there being silicon available um in quantity and at a price that we can build um dev boards at so um this will be one of hopefully many future beagle five boards with different feature sets um so um yeah it's gonna be kind of like what we've done with other boards um the one constraint is like many other soc vendors don't necessarily have like full public documentation so that's something that we have to work on um but uh yeah i'm excited about the the future of um other beagle five boards as well that'll maybe have different features different price points things like that um and for for me like you know we're, we're you know, with beagle like we're, we're trying to um be everything from from education um on to production um right but i think some it, sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming and confusing for folks when trying to, to understand the full breadth of of the the class of embedded problems that we're, we're trying to to solve um right um you know because you know, ti provides a lot of uh, silicon that's ready to scale in production today um but you know beagle's trying to pave the way for um developing engineers you know from from now and 10 years from now um right so like it's really critical for us to, to kind of play an early role in risk five where we think a lot of stuff is going but maybe not a lot of um um uh like ready for scale um solutions are available right so um i don't know if i put my foot in my mouth nishant's making a face like what are you talking about <laughs> well i will say it's, uh risk five is not at the point uh risk five system on chips running a full operating system like Linux is, are not the point yet where probably it would be a good idea to like build full scale production products on. Um, one one big reason is is like the the risk five function set profile for for 2023 will be I think an important one and there's no silicon yet that that has all the the extensions in that profile yet. So um, this is kind of I think a time now for like early access development um, getting so your software working well in risk five prototyping and then i think next year in in continuing on from that we'll see socs that are probably uh in a better position to have like long-term availability that, that you'd build products around well things are going to happen really quickly right because um you know 32-bit risk five is already in high high production right um uh right so there's when it comes to 32-bit risk five um, right, there's a tremendous amount of that stuff being built today. Um, you know, stuff that leverages the um, you know the ability to kind of extend the instruction set for doing things like you know hard drive read channels and um, you know doing um, wireless communication stuff um, for you know at the 32-bit microcontroller level. Right, I think what's emerging now is this 64-bit you know desktop capable, mobile phone capable. Um, you know, high end embedded system capable stuff, um, you know, but, you know, I think Beagle five ahead strikes a really interesting point um, where you're, you're starting to, to kind of see that go into, um, you know, Im embeddable processors, right? So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how far people can go with it. Yeah, for example, I think what pe people will see this T had TH1520 SOC ship and products in my i believe they will probably be low to mid-range like android devices like tablets they will not be um android compatible in that like they will not have the play store um it'll take the next generation of socs to have sufficient feature set that it'll meet a google's requirements for the risk 5 um abi um but i this soc is capable enough that i think we will see it in products um for some things for like you know uh, I think mainly, like, probably I would not be surprised if we see this in, like, low to mid-range, like, tablets um, that are based on Android open source platform AOSP. Um, but then it'll be the next generation of silicon that'll um, be compatible enough, feature-rich enough that it'll be able to support what, what Google wants for the official Android API. Um, but my guess next year, you'll probably be able to buy, like, a tablet that has this SOC in it. Um, and yeah. then my I guess think, um, two, two years from now i i think we'll see a lot of android devices based on risk 5 socs uh, there is also a roma laptop from 2022 which is based on the exact same chip we are using yes. on 
uh, Beagle Five ahead. So yeah, that exactly. Works. I think yeah. it's a little cost prohibitive, though, right? I mean, I think uh, Beagle Five Ahead is a way easier, uh, way cheaper, uh, more reasonable ways to kind of dip your toe into this, right, than that laptop, right? So I think we're solving a, a pretty key problem um, for the the TH1520 developers, right? That, uh, um, you know, with something that they can, um, you know, embed into something that looks like a product today and um, and actually use in an affordable way. Yeah. Definitely. And, and this is much higher performance in terms of the CPU performance than boards that are based around the older Sci-Fi U74 cores. Um, so in terms of what you can get right now in RISC-V, like this TH1520 is, I would say, the highest performance as a CPU that you can get right now. Um, so like from my perspective, this is kind of like BeagleBoard 10, well, 12, 10 years ago, right? Where you, it was like your first ability to get like a reasonably priced uh, ARM development board, right? To start bringing up your software and ARM, getting it working well, right? So I think we're kind of at that stage, but I think that the it'll be on a much more accelerated timeline, right? So I think uh, next year and the year after, you'll see a lot more capable RISC-V SOCs, and we'll hopefully have you know future Beagle Five boards. Um, but uh, I think this one is a great one to start. Start people start getting experience with Risk Five, starting optimizing their software for Risk Five, um, because you can do a lot in like QEMU, for example. But you can't do things like uh, certain types of optimization work and certain types of bugs you won't find QEMU. So it's really important to actually test things and optimize things on real hardware. And and I, I'm I'm super interested in this one for the the ability to to work with you know like having a native build platform, having a high performance, you know, um, software development platform. Um, but for a lot of end applications, you don't necessarily need this much performance in an embedded, like from a embedded uh, CPU core, right? Some of the, the sci five cores, um, and, you know, some of the, the, the vendors out there, I think are, are really in a good spot to kind of produce um, embedded systems capable designs right where maybe you don't need this degree of performance right yeah or maybe maybe um like we see a lot with the beagle bone is you don't necessarily need like a ton of arm general purpose compute but you need some like real time or hardware specific peripherals and things like that so i think there'll also be interesting areas there where like um you know maybe a lower end uh, risk five core but then having some form of like uh real time control as well so i think that can also be as well um, but, you know, we talked a lot about Vector, and I would say, uh, you know, my personal feeling is I'm not even too concerned about Vector or not. You know, without even without Vector, this still outperforms uh, boards that are based on the Sci-Fi U74, I believe. So, like, it's still the fastest thing, even if you aren't using Vector, right? Um, so, I'm using, you know, upstream tool chains, GCC12. So, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about having the uh, pre-draft Vector support. And it's still, I think, uh, faster than any of the other Risk Five dev boards that I have. The only comment I'm gonna make is uh, high performance Risk Five is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and th these are finally. I mean, I would say one of the biggest things is this is finally this is a out of order um, twelve stage pipeline. It's much more capable than the other Risk Five cores that you see. Uh, than the Risk Five cores you see in other SOCs that you can get right now um, from like previous generations. That, mainly the ones that are based around like the Sci-Fi U74. Um, this is a much higher performance core design. We haven't had a lot of drop off, but Andre, you should probably cut us off here. I think we've no, I was, I was letting you know that an hour and a half, I think was, was going to be what the cutoff for, uh, for most people. So, <laughs> Hey, it was, it was a good talk. So I did, didn't want to cut you guys short. All right. Well, I think this was, this was great. Thanks for coming again. Thanks for joining. Thanks for everyone who listened in. Um, it's going to be available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as always, after this, in audio form, uh, videos on YouTube. And uh, see you in two weeks. See you. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.